I'm going to talk about uh, the sinner's x-ray or an x-ray of a sinner. I went to the doctor a while back and I said, Doc, my back is hurting me. I hurt really bad down low. And uh, he said, well, we'll take an x-ray of it. And he poked around on it and said, we'll take an x-ray. And so I went and got an x-ray. And, you know, I didn't have to take my pants off. I didn't have to take my shirt off. They just shot right through my clothes. I mean, just boom. And they could see right down to the bone. And uh, I go back in the office and he says, well, yep, you got back pain, low back pain. I said, well, that cost me 60 bucks to find that out. I, when I came in, I had low back pain. Just find out, I could have told you that. But, you know, God looks at us and he doesn't just see the exterior. God sees very down deep in our life. And I'd like for you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the third chapter of the book of Romans. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to use one verse, verse 23. And I'm going to go through a lot of verses really fast. And the reason I'm going to go really fast is because you guys don't listen really long. So I'm going to go really fast because you don't listen really long. But <laughs> the Bible, this verse is tremendous. Uh, Romans 3.23. And it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I could spend another 15 minutes convincing you that you're a sinner. But I don't need to do that. Everybody in this room knows that we needed Jesus because we were sinners. Pull it down just a shade, would you please? And so thank God for the fact that Jesus Christ loves sinners. He's an awesome, incredible God. And so I'm going to talk about the x-rays of a sinner. You may be seated tonight. Once again, I'll be covering a, a real fast uh, passage and go through a lot of scriptures real quickly, and then we'll get into the structure and the shouting, the ranting, and the raving toward the end of the message. Amen. You ain't had church until there's some ranting and raving, right? You got to have that. Some shouting and praising and glorifying God. I mean, you don't want to come to church and just be raked over the coals. You don't want to come to church and just be have a an X-ray and you know and and I won't admit it. You know, you know they take an X-ray. Whatever the Lord reveals, it's between me and the Lord. I, I, I may know that there's a difference between being humble and stupid. And I'm very humbly uh, say to everyone in this room that we have all sinned. And so I could read to you verse 10 through 18 in Romans chapter 3 and give you the description or the x-ray of a sinner. But I'm not going to do a lot of reading from chapter 10, or verse 10 rather, down to verse 18 in chapter 3 of Romans because I don't have to convince anybody in this room that sin is definitely a serious issue and that Jesus Christ came to help us through. Uh, have you discovered that not everybody on your block is Christians. Has anybody ever discovered not everybody that you go to the supermarket and meet is Christians? Has everybody discovered not everybody you work with is Christians? Shoot, I found out not everybody that comes to my church is Christians. But anyway, <laughs> I could have talked all day and not said that. But anyway, it ain't all day. It's nighttime now. But the Bible gives a description of the x-ray of a sinner. And one of the first things it says about the sinner, the lost man that doesn't know Christ, is that he has eye trouble. A sinner has eye trouble. They can't see the goodness of God, yet they see everything they shouldn't see. Hello. They want to see everything they shouldn't see. They refuse to see, see things they ought to see. I trouble. Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Job said in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 20, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail. They shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. 
Proverbs 27, verse 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. That's why television is, is such a success. That's why the computer and all those things and those games and everything we look at is such a success. Everybody don't want to just sit and look at a wall. They want to see something moving. Amen. You want to see a preacher moving too. I understand that. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 14 says, Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Now, that's a very important um, uh, passage of Scripture because we live in a society today that has eyes full of adultery. Men, not just men, women too, have eyes full of adultery. If they're sinners, if they're sinners, they do. Sinners have eye trouble. And I would like to say that men has mostly this trouble, but we live in a generation now that women have equally as much problem with eye trouble. Eyes full of lust and cannot cease from sin. Uh, a woman can't even walk down the sidewalk without a man undressing her with his eyes. Vice versa. And our eyes are not made to intake bad things. Our eyes are made to, so that we don't stumble over things, that we be able to see the beauty and the light and the glorious blessing of God. Our eyes are not meant for darkness. They're receptacles for light. And our whole body is full of light because of our eyes. But we don't want to take in things. That, you can be poisoned by things you take in through your eyes just as easy as you can be poisoned by things you take in through your mouth. Hello. I remember when I was a little boy, and I've shared this before, I lived down on Elm Street, down where Alice Blanchard lives. And I grew up, I was, a, I was the sweetest, kindest, most gentle, most obedient child that ever grew up in that neighborhood. Alice sitting there saying, boy, he's lying now. But I never will forget one time, uh, Esty Martin had grown some, a garden, and in that garden was those little bitty thin red peppers. Well, you know, I saw them and thought, man, those are, those are, cool they weren't cool they were hot but anyway and I thought man them are nice and I played with them things I got me a bucket full of them and I was just swishing around fooling around with them and I got them all over my hands and for some reason I reached up and just scratched my eye just you know rubbed my eye oh my goodness the apocalypse started man I tell you what my eyes begin to Boing, 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 like you see on a cartoon. I mean, they, I was burning. And uh, I was crying. I was boo-hooing. And so I ran to the best place you can go, the water fountain. Well, not wasn't the water fountain, the garden hose. Let me give you a little advice. If you get hot peppers in your eyes, don't use water to wash them out. Because all I did was wash it down from, the, from my eyes all the way down my body. I just made a horrible thing. What I should have done is just lay down in the ground and just beg to die. That's what I should have done. But no, I ran like I was a man on fire. Now your eyes are fragile, but yet they'll take in some really bad things. And the Bible says that the sinner has eyes full of adultery, eyes full of lust. And we need to be careful. As Job said, I'll not put my maid before me and sin about my maid. He talked about his eyes. He'd guard his eyes. And so we need to understand that the devil puts all kinds of things out there for us to see that we shouldn't see. Now, does that mean that we have to put a blindfold on and walk around with these, I don't think, I don't know what, what do they call them things they put on horses, like a big old log goggles, what? They, what? Blinders. Blinders. Oh, well, duh. <laughs> blinders on the right side, blinders on the left side. So they can't see out. And uh, they'll, um, they, them horses are keeping focus because they put them blinders on their eyes. 
But we can't run around with our eyes bandaged and, you know, with, uh, we've got to be able to see, we've got to be able to live, live. So it's not so much the eyes that's in our head. It's the eyes that's in our heart. And we need to make sure that our heart has pure eyes. That our heart has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God this sinner found Jesus Christ. And you can call me what you want to, but the Bible says I'm a saint. Hello, everybody say the pastor's a saint. You cowards. Even Jerry said, yes, he is. But I didn't hear the word saint. Now, our Catholic friends, you've got to die before you can become a saint. Well, I just soon skip that issue. Jesus Christ born again me, and because of that, I became a saint. And so the Bible says that a sinner has eyes full of adultery or eyes, eye trouble. Not only does a sinner have eye trouble, but a sinner has throat trouble. Throat trouble. Romans 3 verse 13 says their throat is an open sepulcher. Psalm 5 verse 9 says, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wicked. Their throat is an open sepulcher they flatter with their tongue well there's a reason we get bad breath hello have you ever got around someone that had bad breath and it's like oh. man just knock you plumb across the room they just had their garlic and onions for the day and they walk up to it how you doing brother Man, it just blows you away. Man, I, I hate it when that happens. And I really hate it when people eat sardines or something. I, man, I tell you what. Talk about, a, talk about a, a breath smelling worse than a dog's breath. I mean, that's awful. But the reason you have problems with, is this going to be one of them nights? But anyway, the, the reason the throat, uh, there's bad breath or whatever, the throat is an open sepulcher. What do you put in a sepulcher? You put something dead in the sepulcher. And what you put in your mouth, if it isn't dead, it will be dead by the time you get it down. Amen? You say, preacher, you're crude. I know. Uh, I watched my son have some dead shrimp yesterday. I ate some dead beans. I ate some dead chicken. I ate some dead cow for dinner today. You say, that's so morbid. Well, the other one would be worse if I stood up and said I had some live chicken today. That'd be worse, wouldn't it? So a sepulcher is where you put dead things. And I want you to understand that the Bible teaches very clearly, except we eat of the flesh of Jesus Christ and drink his blood, will never go to heaven. Now, does that mean that we're going to eat his literal flesh? Does that mean that we eat, drink his literal blood? Absolutely not. But it does mean that Jesus, so wonderfully among us, we've got to believe he is who he says he is, and we've got to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we've got to lay hold of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I believe it. I believe Jesus Christ came to this earth and just beat the devil snot, beat the snot out of the devil, amen. I believe Jesus Christ came to planet earth and he, he, he opened blinded eyes and he raised the dead and he caused uh, the lame to leap for joy. I believe Jesus was pure, holy son of almighty God. God robed in flesh. He went to the cross. He took our death. He took our shame. He took our sin. He shed his blood for our sins and he went to the graveyard and Jesus Christ, after for three days and three nights, he kicked both ends out on the grave, out of the tomb. And Jesus Christ arose from the grave. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead. He's the living Savior. Amen. And if Jesus is alive, and he is, then we ought to be alive too, praise God. And so the Bible says that sinners throat is an open sepulcher. And the only way that we're going to live forever, the reason we die is because we eat dead things. So Jesus Christ says you need to eat living things. 
something living, and you need to drink living water. And Jesus Christ told us in, in uh, Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4 4, uh, uh, that uh, uh, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And this is not bread that, and Judy makes some really good homemade bread. I'm not going to tell you when next time she's going to make it because I don't want you coming by the house getting it. But anyway, she made some homemade cinnamon rolls, and she knew I was on a diet. I love that woman. I love that woman with all my heart. But when she makes cinnamon rolls, that's beyond my capacity to restrain. And she knows that. And so, you know, just because she's skinny don't mean, you know, she can eat, eat like a horse and still look thin and trim. But I, I eat like a horse and I look like a pig. <laughs> Amen? Come on. <laughs> now, I've lost some weight and I've kept it off and I'm proud of that. And I get up here and toot, toot my horn a little bit because I have lost some weight and I've kept it off. And I thank God for that. But listen to me. Unless a man drinks of water that does not come from planet earth. If he keeps drinking, he'll thirst again if he drinks water of the earth. But if he drinks the water that Jesus shall give us, it'll be in him a well springing up into everlasting life and we shall live forever because of that everlasting water that comes to God's word. The manna that comes down from above, the living bread of God, receiving the love of God. So if, if we just hung up on buffets of planet Earth, just hung up on buffets of sin and buffets of pleasure, buffets of things, if we just live like, a, like an animal, just live like a, like a dog or a, a, a cat or a, a horse or a, a pig or a cow, or we just live like an animal just for the next drink of earthly water and the next uh, a chew of, of sweet corn or mesh or some kind of food, then we're no different than the animal kingdom. But praise God, we're not animal of the animal kingdom. We're of the kingdom of God. Praise God, we're far above the animal kingdom. We are made in the image of God Almighty. And you let atheists, they'll say we're animals. We're not animals. We are supernatural, created in the image of God beings, and we're not meant to die like a dog and lay in a, a field somewhere or die like an animal and lay in the field. We're not meant to do that. We're meant to take a nap and be asleep down here and awake up there and wait for the return of Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You say, preacher, is there no end to your preaching? Well, you're going to really wish, the, you're, you're really going to throw out your anchor and wish for the day on this one. Tongue trouble. Sinners have tr tongue trouble. Verse 15 of Romans 3 says, with their tongues they have used deceit. James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, and uh, it sets uh, that, that so is the tongue among our members. It is defiled. The, it defiles the whole body and is set on fire of hell. Now, I want you to know that not only is the, the, the sinner have tongue trouble, he's got lip trouble. Romans 3, 13 says the poison of asp is under his lips. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 12 says the word of the wise man or the, the, the word of the wise man's mouth are, the, are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Have you ever got around people with tongue trouble, lip trouble, mouth trouble? Uh, the x-ray of a sinner produces mouth trouble. Romans 3, 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Job chapter 9, verse 20, if I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Proverbs 15, 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Now listen to me very carefully. Important that you understand that, that whatever comes out of your mouth is just a clear signal of what's down in your heart. If, you're, if, you're, if your mouth isn't clean, your heart's not clean.
clean. If, you're, if your vocabulary is not clean, your heart's not clean. Because you're, 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 you get around people and they'll say they're Christians and they'll say they love God, but their, their vocabulary betrays them. That, that sounds horrible. And you say, well, preacher, I, I believe that we can be great children of God and just say what we want, live the way we want. We can if we really got the God of want in our heart and God's really doing the wanting and we're responding to the one of God in our heart. But, but understand me, Jesus Christ didn't die on that cross of Calvary, shed his blood, suffered and died on that cross, went to the tomb and arose again from the grave for you to live just like you've always lived. Jesus Christ came to step inside of us and change us and make us a new creature in Christ. Jesus Christ came here to give us eternal life and, and my mouth is clean. My, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have to watch what I say anymore because what I say is coming from my heart and my heart's clean. As long as my heart's clean, and, and then I don't have to guard myself uh, from the things I say. There are, there are a lot of people today that try to, to work righteousness into their life or try to work their way into the things, uh, do certain things to be uh, pleasing to God. Now let me say this right now. I never will forget the story about the guy that came to the preacher and said, preacher, I'm having a hard time. Every time I cuss, uh, my heart condemns me. He said, I, he said, I try not to cuss, but he said, I do cuss. And so the, uh, the, the preacher had a great big old thick song book. And he said, here, every time you cuss, you just sing one of those songs, tear the page out, sing the other side when you cuss, and then, uh, and then you'll find out another language and Lord will bless you. Well, the guy come back just a half a day later and said, uh, you got another song book? Hello. <laughs> we, it is another songbook we need. And it is another chance that we need in the flesh. We have Jesus. And there is no another Jesus. He is one. He is the sovereign deliverer of you and I. And so the sinner, he, his, his voice condemns him. He says things that he and say his mouth and the reason for all that is he has heart trouble a sinner has heart trouble Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it well if I can't know my heart then I, I just need to get my heart born again amen if I don't know my heart, then I need to get the stony heart removed and a heart of flesh put in by the power of the Holy Ghost. I need God to do something in my life. And there's a con, have you noticed there's a difference between night and day? Have you noticed that there's darkness and there's light? Have you noticed that there's a difference between God's people and the, and the lost people out there? There's a difference. If you can't see the difference, <laughs> You better back up or run full steam ahead to the altar and regroup because you ain't got what you need. Amen. I'm not trying to bully you around tonight. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Hello. I hate preachers that get up and try to bully people around. I don't, I don't think that's Bible. I don't think you should bully people around. If I thought I could bully you around and... I would do it, but it ain't gonna, it wouldn't help a bit, amen? I just end up getting two black eyes and have to crawl home. Amen? Come on now, I'm preaching better than you're responding. So let's come to two little thoughts, and then we'll be done. What do the worldlings of this world, what do they love? What do the worldlings of this world love? What is it that they love? Well, i just give you some scriptures real quick. Their heart's not right. And so they don't love God. And here it is, they love their own selves. There's people out there, they love their own self. 2 Timothy 3, 2 says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. I can't stand to be around someone that just loves themselves. And they just love themselves. They love themselves. And it's obvious they love themselves. And I can't stand to be around people that love themselves in an arrogant way. Now, I, I reverence myself because God tells me to take care of myself, but I'm not going to love myself and leave God out of the equation. 
But there are people everywhere that just love themselves. You know what? People who love themselves are full of themselves. And people who love their neighbor and love God are full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Spirit of God, full of the Word of God. People that are full of themselves will never have the blessing of God in their life. If you're ever going to have God bless you, you've got to pour the self out and let the mighty, majestic Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost come inside. Let, G, let the Word of God come inside. Amen? And then your cup can run over, praise the Lord. Amen? I know I've said at least two things that was worth coming tonight for. At least a couple. What do the worldlings love? Well, they love their own selves. Not only do they love their own selves, they love pleasures. Second Timothy 3, 4, they're money lovers. There's people out there that they're just money lovers. Now, I'm, I don't hate money. I, I wouldn't consider myself a money lover, but I am a money liker. <laughs> Hello? Well, you can't get electric bills and not like money. You can't get bills and have to take care of things and go to the grocery store and not like money. Come on. But love money, lust for money, lo money lovers. Second Timothy 3, 4, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. There are people out there that just, they're just lovers of pleasure. And churches would be full, big churches, little churches, middle-sized churches, be packed full if it wasn't for the lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure. I can't compete, we can't compete Compete with amusement parks. But if you've got the right heart inside of you, and Jesus, Paul says in your heart, we got just what you're looking for. Amen. Amen? Come on. And so the worldlings of this world, they, they, they love themselves, they love pleasure, they love money, and not only that, they love this world. They are deeply attached to this world. They, they, they want to hang on tight to the world. Let me tell you, friends, I don't care how tight you hang on to this world, you will let go someday. Now, you can choose to let go now and lay hold of Jesus Christ, or you can choose to make death and hell come and pry your dying hands off the world and drag you into an eternal judgment. You can choose one of those two. I just soon choose to lay my hands, reach out to Jesus, and ask Jesus to come in my life. I don't want to be uh, addicted and so so attached to the world because being attached to the world uh, is not a good proposition at all. First John chapter two, verse fifteen and seventeen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will, he that doeth the will, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Isn't that beautiful? He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This world's going to crumble, but praise God, Jesus is not. This world's gonna collapse, but praise God, God's word will never collapse and never fail. We have a promise from on high. We have a promise of God's blessing, and we can trust God. I had someone tell me one time, um, they were from California, and there's probably several people in this room from California. I'm from it, but I didn't stay very long. I got passed through real fast, but anyway. Uh, I've been in California many times and, and preached revivals in California. There are some great Christians in California, by the way. I don't want to speak irreverently at all. There are some great Christians there and great preachers there in California. And besides that, people watch me on YouTube in California. But anyway, uh, I, I'm diplomatic here. But the, the truth is, California is a beautiful state. It really is. It's gorgeous. But it is bankrupt. It's bankrupt. The money is not there to do what they're doing. And I want you to understand, 
I told somebody they were they were from California, and they said, and I told them I said, California's in trouble like many of the other states are in trouble. The finances are not there; they're bankrupt. And I'll never feel, forget what the person said to me. How could that possibly be? All that money in Hollywood, all that money down there in Los Angeles and Hollywood, and down through that, and them vineyards and them uh, great uh, orchards and all. How could that possibly be? And I just replied to the person by saying it can, it can be because people don't live in their means. People do not live within their means. And my friend, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're not living in your means. You are stretching it too far when you don't allow Jesus Christ to be supreme in your life. This world will pass away. This world will crumble. This world will... Uh, it, the flesh will be like the, the, the grass that uh, burns and withers away. But listen to me. What do God's saints love? I talked about some things of what the lost sinner loves or the worldlings of this world love. What do God's saints love? Well, we know they love church and we know they love Jesus and we know they love God's word and we know they love the spirit of God. We know they love many things that are attached to the things of God. But let's talk about what Christians, really saints of the Lord, love. And, I, and, and you'll, you'll discover in Psalm 119, the thing that we need to love most is God's Word. I said the thing that we need to love most is God's Word. Paul talked about that God's saints love the form of sound words. And those form of sound words about God's love and power. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the form of sound words. You know, that's one thing that I've worked hard at as a pastor. I'm not the greatest articulator. I'm a better agitator than I am an articulator. I, I'm not a great speaker, and I understand that. But here's what I want you to understand. I don't have to be a great speaker. I've got some great word of God and some great promises of God. That's the thing. You know, you just look beyond my inability to articulate and, and speak sometimes and just see what I'm saying. My friends, the Bible is sound form of words. John 3.16 is a, a, a sound form of words. What does that mean? God loves us. And God sent his word to heal us and deliver us from all of our destruction. Well, what is God's word? Jesus. God sent his word. God sent Jesus to deliver us from our sin. Thank God we've got something solid tonight solid to stand on, solid to trust, and solid to look forward to. God is truly real in this house. He's real in your heart as a child of God. And, and Paul said, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to know that when I preach, that's one of my duties, to give you um, sound, a form of sound words. And believe me, I've been in some meetings where there was no form or soundness in the place. Amen. You know, it's awful when I have to amen myself. <laughs> you anemic ameners. You need, a, you need an amen transfusion. You are low on amen. Oh, that's so pathetic. Amen. Say, so, preacher, you're going to make me mad. Yes, you've been mad before. Christian saints, they love the return of Jesus Christ. I love the return of Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him. Man, that charges me up to know that Jesus is coming. The imminent return of Jesus Christ is coming. And when Jesus comes, ain't nothing's going to stop him. When Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, there's nothing going to stop him. 
2 Timothy 4, verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, Paul says, but unto all them also, I love that, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I love it, I love it, I love it, don't you? I love it, I love it, I love it, don't you? Jesus is coming, there's hope. He came and changed my life. He's coming and gonna change this place I live. In fact, he's gonna get me out of here and they can have it for a while, I'll be somewhere else. Amen, praise the Lord, isn't that good? All right, I I don't wanna overload you tonight. I want you fed, but I don't want you fed up. I've heard a lot of preachers use the scripture in Psalm 121 at a graveside, and it's a great scripture. But in Psalms 121, it says in verse 1, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, what in the world is he talking about? I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. Well, in Jerusalem and Israel, in that section of the country, the Middle East, it's known for many mountains, many hills. And when I think about, I lift up my eyes from which cometh my help, I think of the first big mountain has got to be Mount Sinai. Where God gave us his commandments, thou shalt not. That is the mountain of God's law. And you know what? I have broken a mountain of God's laws. There's a mountain against me. That mountain of God's law. But how many know there's another mountain just outside of Jerusalem called Mount Calvary? And that mountain of God is, uh, is, is, is a mountain of God's love and forgiveness. And God will bring you from Sinai and bring you to Mount Calvary to the mountain of God's love and forgiveness and God will change your life. He changed my life. Has he changed yours? He changed my life. Has he changed yours? He has. And then after we get saved, you know, I looked at Mount Sinai and trembled. I look at Mount Sinai, the law of God, and say, there's no hope for me. As a sinner, I couldn't see it. But then I looked at Mount Calvary, the mountain of God's love and power, and I said, that's it, that's it. And I came and knelt at the feet of Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, and Jesus Christ lifted me up and changed my life. And now I'm a child of God. Now I look to another mountain. It's the mountain that Jesus left here on. He went outside of Bethany and there on the Mount of Mount Olivet, in the Mount of Olives area, Mount Olivet, Jesus Christ raises his hands out. He blesses his disciples. And while he's blessing them, the Bible says he's taken up. He's caught up. I love this phrase. And I gotta, I gotta get this out of my system. You say, preacher, uh, 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 don't you think you preached a little too long? No, I'm gonna, I gotta finish this or I'll never sleep tonight. Listen to what it says. Luke 24, verse 50. Jesus led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them and it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted. You know, you know where we're living right now? We're living in the time while he blesses us. You and I are living in the time while he blesses us. And the Bible says that while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Acts chapter one verse nine says, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now the typical painting and the typical um, illustration we have the day of the ascension of Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus in a, in a white robe and he's just barely floating up through the sky. He's got his hands out, blessing everybody. And I'm not against that picture. But the Bible says that he was taken up by force. He was taken up. He wasn't floating up. He was taken up. 
The Bible says he was parted from them. I believe there was something cataclysmic that took place. While Jesus was blessing them, I believe that there was not a rapture down, there was a rapture up. And I believe Jesus experienced what we're going to experience when Jesus comes back to get us. Just as Jesus got off of Mount Olivet and was caught up to meet Jesus in the air, we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air too. And we're going to be taken out of here by the power of Almighty God. I don't believe it was some kind of, some kind of, you know, um, floating up through the clouds and Jesus kind of hides behind the cloud and, and he ducks behind and he disappears. That's not the kind of God I see. I see Jesus blessing his people. And while he's blessing his people, God just parts him from them. And God the Father just takes him up. Like Elijah was taken up in the chariots of fire and the horses of fire. God just took him up. And took him up, and the Bible says he was wrapped in a cloud. I don't believe that was one of them little white clouds that our jet airplanes fly through. I believe it was a cloud of glory. I believe it was a cloud of might and a cloud of power. And Jesus was taken up into the clouds of the glory. Isn't that good? Now, I, I want to say this just before we give the invitation. Josh can make his way this way. But, but I mentioned in the sermon this morning that what is the greatest commandment that God gave the Jews and gave us. It's found in Luke 10, 27. I think I gave the wrong address this morning. But it says, the Bible says that we are to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Now, how many believe God practices what he preaches? So if we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then I believe God loves us with all of his heart. It was his heart that brought his son to the cross of Calvary. It is his heart that saves us and gives us eternal life. It is his heart that came and did all that he did because God loved us. And I believe he not only gave all of his heart and loved us with all his heart, he still loves us with, with all of his heart, God does. And he loves us with all of his soul. And I don't know what kind of soul God has. It's a much better one than I've got. And it's a much better one than you've got. But whatever God's soul is, it's incredible, majestic, beyond description. And he loves us with all he is. With all he is, he loves us. And he loves us with all his mind. God is thinking some good things for us. God is thinking some blessings for us. His mind is consumed with us. And then the Bible says that we're to love God with all of our strength. And that's what God did when he came. He loved us with all of his strength. You know, I don't know all of God's strength. I don't believe God has ever used all of his strength. But it took a lot of strength for God to let his son die on that cross. And it took a lot of strength to raise his son from the grave, the father. And it took a lot of strength for Jesus Christ to go back to heaven, sit at the right hand of God the Father, make an intercession for you and I. And it's gonna take a lot more strength of God to get us off of this stinking planet. Is that preacher, how dare you say stinking planet? You just said California is beautiful. I know it is. The land is gorgeous. Uh, Missouri, gorgeous place. I may well agree Missouri is gorgeous. Uh, and then along about August, the chiggers set in. But anyway, it's a beautiful place. The seed dick said it. But Missouri is beautiful. The uh, um, uh, United States, of America, the whole world is gorgeous. It's beautiful as far as land and as far as God's wonderful creation. But listen to me. Man's pretty much messed it all up. Hello? Man's pretty much messed it all up. Amen? I don't know what it is, but I think some people believe that the ditch out here in front of our church is a return area for beer bottles. I, I don't understand it, but it just seems like every drunk in the country is going to unload his beer bottles. He'll bypass 10 waste baskets before he gets down here. And then he'll roll down his window and he'll sell an empty beer bottle. And, and you know what? 
I'm glad that they're empty because I'd be afraid some of our folks might be getting them. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, I just seen the other day, Dave down there turning one up and down, see if there's anything in it. I'm kidding. But, but you know, the, the truth is, and, and I shouldn't do that today because Dave is so awesome and blessing in our church. and He does the work of, of, of 10 horses. Amen. He's a working, working horse. He's busy. And he's a, he's a laborer for the Lord, and I appreciate him so much. So, excuse me, Dave, for that. But, but really, people throw their beer bottles out. Years ago, no one would think of doing that to a church. But now, they, they get some kind of thrill. I remember one time, we had two vans out here in the parking lot. Someone pulled between the two vans, and they had a beer party between our two church vans. The next morning I came out here and there's beer bottles on both sides. And they'd, obviously they'd gotten drunk. Well, you know what? I got mad about it a little bit, but you know what? I'd rather them be there than out on the highway driving. Amen? Hello? And if they ever got caught driving drunk on the highway... I think the judge ought to sentence him to 50 years in Ozark Full Gospel Church. Amen. Hello? Now, judges won't do that because they're wimps, but I, <laughs> I had someone get, um, what do they call that, the public service. They had to do so many hours, and someone got a hold of me and said, uh, can I come and work with your church? And I said, sure, you can. Uh, as long as we get it approved by the court, the judge, and the judge approved it. And I said, now, if you'll come during service and listen to the service and enjoy the service, and then right after kind of pick up things and, uh, and before and after, then we'll give you that time while you're listening to the Word of God. She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. She refused to sit in church and listen to the gospel. She'd rather go out and rake leaves, pick up trash or whatever. I'm telling you why, somebody give me a deal like that, praise God, I'll sit in church and listen to someone preach. I'll even sit in church and listen to Josh preach. I'll do it all the way. Man, stand with me. <laughs> I, I'm, I went a little longer tonight than I should have, but I just want you to, we got a good crowd here tonight, and we want to keep having a good crowd on Sunday night. I hope that you receive something tonight that will make you stronger. God is so good and so rich and so wonderful. And if you've got Jesus on your side, you're going to win. That you're going to win. You're going to win. It's that simple. It's that easy. Josh sings, you come. Alders come. You can come and pray.